Welcome back to D&D Beyond. And I am delighted to have with me today my favorite person to get expert advice from on running a terrifying, <laughs> unforgettable scenarios and all the other kinds of scenarios in Dungeons and Dragons. Please welcome back, Jasmine Bueller. How are you today? I'm doing great, Amy. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And I'm very excited because Spelljammer Adventures in Space is almost here. It's gonna be out Tuesday, August 16th. Uh, and along with all of the worlds you can see and creatures you can encounter and the adventure that comes with it, as you're sailing wild space and those astral seas, here there'll be monsters and here there'll be unfriendly other ships. So what are we gonna do? Jasmine, can you talk to me a bit about ship combat, a little preview of how this is gonna work and how we can make the mm. most of it as DMs or players. Help me, I need to live, there are pirates. <laughs> okay, ship combat, just, just some background. Ship combat is something that I love so much so that for season one of Into the Motherlands, uh, in the adventure I wrote for that, I included ship combat as part of uh, the season one campaign when I was designing it because I there's something about giant ships in space that just appeals to my heart. Maybe it's playing all that X-Wings mi miniature game, but uh, uh, I'm very <laughs> excited for ship combat and Spelljammer, especially because ship combat and Spelljammer includes a little bit more magiciness instead of just being, you know, hard science fiction, which allows us to have a little bit more fun. Um, the way it works, well, Okay, this is where it gets this is where it gets a little complicated. You have air pockets of breathable air around each ship and beyond that is where, you know, you get into the vacuum of space and unbreathable air where you might suffocate and die. Uh each ship has a number of hit points. The ship with more hit points at the end of combat is the one that is deemed the victor in ship combat and uh recommended rules are to use a, a side rule that a lot of people don't use, but I've actually always loved from the DMG using side initiative instead of rolling for initiative of each and every creature on both of the ships. Um, I don't know, I mean, are we going to get into how side initiative works today? Or are we going to... That's actually, this is a lot of the stuff I was hoping we would hit. So this is a little <laughs> outline of where we're going. Let's start with some of these basics on uh, Wild Space mm -hmm. and the Astral Sea. Folks who've been following along with the wonderful articles led by my colleague Michael Galvis on dndbeyond.com will already know some of this info because we've had some guides go up. Um, I'm going to pull up right now, such as the Spelljammer's Guide to Wild Space in Dungeons and Dragons, which is going to introduce you to some of uh, these concepts that we're talking about. Uh, the way that your air is going to work, the way that your gravity is going to work, and that both of those have a little bit of element of to fight one of them wins, uh, Triangle Man style, um, when you are, are zooming around in both the environment mm -hmm. of wild space, which is uh, can't breathe outside your envelope, and uh, Astral Sea, which works a little bit differently, but you still have these like circular gravity areas. I'm, I'm mucking it up, but the article does a good job. Um, <laughs> I don't so think these you're mucking are it up at all. <laughs> basic facts to keep in mind. Uh, when you're in your little kind of system bubble and when you are traversing the astral sea full of interesting things like dead gods floating out there um, <laughs> and some fun varieties of monsters. Um, but first, what would you like to dive into first of these rules? What are some sort of basic things to keep in mind when you're doing ship combat at all? I would say maybe like, how I mean, do I think about distance in these things? Um distance is something that's really determined by the, the by the dungeon master um because especially in space distance can become something that's like very relative uh but i think the number one thing in mind to to keep in mind uh when when doing ship combat is establishing stakes to your players uh making it clear what the victory outcome should look like and making it clear what the loss outcome would be uh, in general, I feel like that is that is true of D and D, but especially so when we get into spelljammer ship combat, because the the conclusion could be potentially catastrophic. Um, and the other thing I have found from running ship combat in other systems as well as D and D is letting the players know what they are working towards, because sometimes there can be a little bit of confusion there. Um, 
you know, like, do, do we run? Do we fight? How does this work? Making sure that your players know, well, in order for this, in order for you to survive this combat, what does that look like? In order for you to win this combat, what does that look like? Because you're in potentially the vacuum of space, which means if your ship were to somehow be destroyed, if you were to somehow lose that air envelope, you would start moving at the rate of, what is it, 10 feet per second towards the nearest uh, heavenly body and only hope that you get there before you suffocate. Um, but it's also good to let your players know what their options are. Because in the Spelljammer ship combat rules, you can also ram other ships and you can board other ships. So this is also important to know if something catastrophic happens to your ship, your crew can still survive. Don't throw your hands up and surrender yourselves to the abyss. Um, you might be able to board the enemy ship as a last ditch effort, maybe commandeer it. Letting your players know what their various options are, especially if they're new to Spelljammer, I think is key here to avoid, you know, having them be potentially disappointed or or completely uh, devastated if uh, sh ship combat goes awry. I think the other important thing to keep in mind is making sure that everyone has a job or everyone feels like they have something they can do. Um, oh, that's a great actual, uh, I'd love to use that as a springboard for the next thing that I want to take a look at with you. Um, and I love everything you've just said about reminding folks what the stakes are and how it works. Um, for instance, there are slightly different, like there are different rules environmentally for wild space bubbles versus the astral sea. Um, and you'll want to know either way, you don't necessarily want to just be drifting out there. Um, but the consequences <laughs> are going to be very different. And you want to make sure your players are keenly aware of where they fall and what is true at any given time. Um, and when they decide what to do with their time during that battle, let's bring up one of the ships. Because in the Spelljammer ah. Academy Adventures, which you can claim, by the way, claim them by the time the book comes out on the 16th. Um, so you can have these no-cost prequel adventures for levels one through four if you'd like to start your players with some terrain and up before you get the uh, level five adventure, the adventure that begins at level five, which comes with Spelljammer and Adventures in Space. There was a shorter version of that sentence, and it's not the one I said. Um, <laughs> but... I hope everyone has checked this out. We got to play a little bit of it with wonderful DM Sage Ryan, and it includes a look at some of our actual, these Spelljammers themselves, which are the ships. So let's mm -hmm. take a look at uh, the Hammerhead ship. So we have some this is stats. Such a cool, this is such a cool I ship. It's so neat. We have some stats on it. We have some indication of what you do, obviously, you're going to have somebody sort of maybe running it. You're going to need somebody to navigate the thing by using the spell jamming helm. And then you need some folks on weapons. So Jasmine, mm -hmm. thoughts on the hammerhead? And can you talk about how you decide who does what? Um, I think who does what should really ultimately come down to the crew where they think their skill lies. Uh, some people are better in leadership positions. Other people are better in, in you know, uh, in more gunning or I guess like manning one of the ballistas or something like that. But I think the important thing when you're establishing who goes where is making sure everyone has the same plan. And this is especially true when we look at the hammerhead because you have a ranged option here and then you also have a melee option. And I think it's really important that everyone be on the same page of, are we going to ram the other ship, potentially board them? Or are we going to try to fire a few shots at range? I think as, as long as your entire crew is on the same page, you can definitely find a harmonious way for everybody to have like something to do. I mean, this ballista is, is actually pretty great. It requires a crew of three to operate with one action to load the ballista, one action to aim it, one action to fire it. I really love that. Because like I was saying earlier, some place where a lot of other games fall apart is if you're not a gunner, if you're not like, what do you do with your turn in combat? I do right. love how collaborative, uh, you know, there's, there's the game naturally sets you up as the DM and the players up to make sure everyone has a role. And something interesting here is this is also a great place, little hack, to get like creatures that otherwise wouldn't be super useful involved. Like, you know, your, your familiars, your, <laughs> your, your sidekicks, you know, we have rules for, for like, you know, our NPC sidekicks now, this is a great place to get them involved. You know, if you have uh, a familiar that otherwise might not be super useful in combat, maybe this is the time to get them on reloading the ballista 
so that you can fire it. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. What that's, that's a great idea, a way to fill out these sort of extra teamwork needed to get these things done. And like you said, we have, um, I, he, I made a mental note to look up how to pronounce these weapons, and then I did not do that thing. So let's see what happens. Um, there's a, a ballista and two mangonels. Um, we can mm -hmm. see, as, as well as the, the blunt ram, which is the melee option you were talking about, we can see from a later... I'm going to navigate there manually. Everybody don't look at any spoilers, um, because I believe we also have a handout somewhere of the ship map that I meant to nobody's seeing things. Um, hold on. There's a map of the hammerhead that I, I quite like um, as well. And I've misplaced it, so we're going to come back to that. Um, but uh, I just wanted to talk about the weapons briefly, Jasmine. If you sort of, mm -hmm. um, we have three I'm looking at the map weapons. right now. <laughs> Perfect. I, I linked it, it's and then I... It's on page 33. I don't know if that helps, but yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will catch up uh, in one moment with that. But the, the, the map of the Hammerhead ship will sh sort of shows the little icons for where they are, although you can point them in any direction. And your spell jammer is going to be determining where the ship goes. So actually, I would love to take a second to talk about what is side initiative, the option that uh, they recommend for running... Uh, this kind of combat. I'm going to pull it up while I ask you to tell me. Yeah, so for side initiative, oh gosh, I really hope I don't fumble this rule because I don't use it all the time, but I use it for big battles. Uh, you take, you as a DM, for the NPCs that are fighting the players, you take the creature with the highest dex modifier and you roll initiative for them and that is rolled against the initiative for the party. And whoever comes out ahead in that is who gets to go first. If by some freak twist of fate, there is a tie that goes in the player's favor. That's, that's my knowledge, I think. I'm so sorry if I get it wrong. I'm sure the YouTube I comments will let me know. I actually love that variation and I did not mean to spring this on you in that way. Um, but I think the, the version that we have, there are a few different initiative variants that are present in chapter nine of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, and uh, I did not know this, so I had just looked it up. Um, it looks like the side initiative specifically refers to a version where you actually do a flat d20 roll for each side, which I think is fascinating. Um, so in oh. this case, in case of a tie, you keep rolling until the tie is broken and its highest wins flat out um with ev within your side you get to choose an order i think mm -hmm. i have heard the variation you described before and i like it a lot so mm -hmm. i'm just going to tell y'all remember dms whatever rule works for you and your table i was um, gonna say i was like i might be wrong <laughs> i'm so sorry about that jasmine i i did that exactly no, you're backwards. Fine. Um, but it is no, a, a very cool fine. our ship is going we decide what order we want to do so if it takes three actions to load aim and fire a weapon we can decide that those things happen in the order we need them to happen without which it would be a little bit difficult <laughs> to manage some of these operations um yes so the other thing you'll want to keep in mind as you referenced is uh you can put sidekicks and things on the weapons and you also are going to have of course all your standard adventurer bag of tricks you're going to have uh spells and weapons and things you're just going to want to be aware of how far they can get because there might be some things you can do from the very very far some things you can do from the medium far and some things you can do as you mentioned what's your advice for if we want to go ramming speed <laughs> so yes you can ram other ships in Spelljammer, and you can board them now ramming speed actually does do damage and the hammerhead is equipped with a ram specifically so you can do damage but uh it's 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 interesting because you don't technically need a ram to do it you can just straight up crash your ship into the other ship you make a special in spell <laughs> yeah you just can do it. like a you can you can do like a do or die situation and slam your ship into the other ship um 
it's it's I think a D20 plus your Spelljammer's proficiency bonus to see if you hit versus the other ship's AC. For example, the AC on a hammerhead ship I think is 15. It's made of wood. Um, but you you smash your ship into the other ship, and unless and I actually really like this rule, unless the DM deigns that no attack roll is necessary, which I actually think is really cool. This might be an opportunity as a DM to add in a deception rule to let players that are like a feint or something like that. Because if it seems like there's no way the other ship would either see you coming, anticipate this move, you know, which is a little bit of a deception, um, then there's there's no roll at all required and you just hit, which is actually kind of fun as well. And from there you can board. <laughs> In addition to doing damage, it's it's really a great maneuver. So you don't you don't need the hammerhead's ram, although the ram does help because the ram does quite a bit of damage if you look at it. And for doing damage, because again, you want to be aware of how your ship is doing, whether it's healthy. Uh, folks who might not have looked at the object rules recently in Dungeon Master's Guide might uh, have not remember a damage threshold is present for these, where basically if I sit there and I punch the deck of the ship, the deck of the ship is probably fine. Um, but if I start exploding things on the deck of the ship that are, if I do 15 or more in a single burst, we're going to start eating away at the life of that ship. And that's going to have consequences. Because if you, there's a different article we have on the site um, by our own Michael Gavis, uh, building your character to survive Spelljammer adventures, which references some of the things that you might need when you are doing ship combat or, or afterwards trying to do some repairs. Repairs can be slow or expensive uh, or both. And uh, having a little mending on hand can help with that. But your your hit points on your ship are very valuable. I don't, I'm explaining difficult concepts like don't let them kill your ship. But, you know, it's something to keep in mind um, as we as we go through uh, ship combat, because we're looking at pretty hefty damage uh, proportions for the onboard weapons. Um, well, I mean, Jeff, even for I want to take out the crashing. crew of the ship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you take out the ship, once you resolve whether or not the gravity plane is still in effect, you could actually just TPK all your enemies. So really it's a it's a it's a matter of determining whether taking out that ship is going to take out your ship. Because the I mean the beliefs to do a lot of damage, the Mangonels do a lot of damage, but they also take quite a hefty sized crew to use and it takes a lot of time to reload and use these weapons. So as laid out in the document, sometimes it's better to use the weapons you have at your own disposal. However, like you were mentioning, Amy, some of that really does depend on how far you are on the distance from the other ship. Um, this is actually, just to, just to add on here, there's like, I, I remember getting into a slight argument about the, the best uh, Eldritch invocations you can take as a warlock because a lot of people feel like the base distance of Eldritch Blast is so much that why would you ever need to upgrade that using the the sort of like, I think, yeah, I think it's invocations. Like most people take Agonizing Blast because you almost never need to increase the range of, of Eldritch Blast. This is one of those places <laughs> to piggyback off of, off of Michael's article where building your character for Spelljammer involves kind of starting to think in terms of space you know, a, a lot of spells that don't shine in your typical D&D campaign and a lot of add-ons that don't shine in your typical D&D campaign will actually start to shine in Spelljammer because it takes three actions to reload, shoot, and aim a Ballista. It does not take three actions to shoot your Eldritch Blast. So getting those little add-ons where that distance starts to come in makes spells that you almost never see and add-ons you almost never see being utilized in base D&D those are going to start to shine. So take a look at those spells that you're like, well, why would you ever use this when you could use Toll the Dead? Start to actually critically look at those spells and you might be able to uh, see that maybe it has a distance of, you know, a, 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 you know, like 120 feet or something like that where it can start to come into play. Um, my other tip would be, if, if, if ostensibly, if you are shooting your Belisa, the other ship is shooting theirs, 
taking out one of the crew members that's shooting the ballista could hamstring them to where this is now a problem. So using your own character's abilities and spells and weapons and items is sometimes more useful than being on a ballista, which is why I was mentioning using familiars and sidekicks to man those is sometimes a good idea. And just having one person kind of head up the crew. I also stole that from Monster Hunter because this is something. <laughs> hey, tactics I'm a, I'm are tactics. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Monster Hunter, and you have some fights there where you uh, have cannons and stuff you can use, and you have these like two little cat familiars that will load the cannon for you. And for some reason, my brain was like, this is definitely something I'm going to use in Spelljammer. I'm going to have two cute cats reloading my ballista for me so that I can shoot it every round. <laughs> I love that. Like, Tabaxi NPCs are like, you know, displace your kittens. <laughs> yes. Yes, see? That's great. <laughs> uh, I, I'm already very excited to try some of those combos because, yeah, hurting their ability to fight back is going to be good. The weapons are going to have their own damage if you want to focus on taking one of those out. Um, I thank you, mods, have finally located what I meant to do, which is the, the nice uh, map view of the hammerhead where you can see the locations of our little weapons um, at the front, the back, the nautical words for front and back, um, and on top here of the hammerhead. And uh, I include that just because I really like these. I love the art and the diagrams in this book. I'm very excited about Spelljammer. But Me too. you can see that this is, is built to, to accommodate a, a good number of folks and uh, a, a sense of where those might be if you are aiming at them. And you can see the gravity plane right down here. And this is something that intrigues me because the idea that if you uh, are gonna share some space with another ship, uh, you gotta worry about your respective air quality and you gotta worry about your respective mm -hmm. gravity because the gravity plane mm -hmm. is down is this way and down is this way, which is very cool. Um, but also means if I come in at an angle, I'm gonna create some fun shenanigans for the other ship because I believe it's most hit points wins and our gravity becomes their gravity? Yes. If, if the yes, ship that has more hit points. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely take a ship off, off, uh, you can affect, you can win with gravity is the easiest way to put this. Like you can, you can actually jettison the enemy crew off the ship. And this can also happen when you crash into a ship, when you resolve the gravity planes, like I was saying earlier, the gravity fields, you actually could, uh, with a crash, send the crew off the ship because their gravity field would be affected. This is the time to pull out those, those lessons from physics, those vector lessons. <laughs> I love it. And of course, part of the fun there is if that's not something you want to worry about at your table, great, don't. If, you're, if your eyes just lit up and you already know exactly how you want to do this, you are going to have a really fun game. Um, I love Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, this is a lot of the stuff I was really wanting to get into. I love, you reminded mm -hmm. me to look at range abilities because we talked recently about the GIF, one of the new playable races, and how they're gonna ignore the long distance problems with firearms. And I've only just now done the math of how very useful that would be. Yes. In yes. some spell jammer ship combat. I see what they did there. <laughs> yeah, especially like, cause you were mentioning earlier about how expensive it is to repair ships. You can only do it while the ship is berthed. It takes a really long time. Um, the same is true, like I was saying, of, of ship weapons. And even if we look at the hammerhead, the ballista only has 50 hit points. Depending on what level you are, and depending on if you have the spells or the, or you know, you can ignore the the distance requirements with firearms, that can be actually chipped away very quickly. And there's not really any way for the enemy crew to repair it if that happens. I mean, the same is also true of your ballista. But it would take, you know, it takes days to repair the ship and tons of gold. You can't really do it on the fly. But this is another place where spells, you have to get creative with spells because you could ostensibly put up, a, 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 you know, you could use defensive spells to maybe protect your ballista and protect the crew inside. That, that is something that you could do. But you could also board the enemy ship and sort of, you know, disable their defenses that way as well. There's there's multiple ways. I love the idea of having one, like half of your party sort of distracting the ship while you have like a shadow crew 
kind of stealthing on or boarding the ship and trying to like, you know, conduct their own maneuver. Um, because you can also destroy the Spelljammer helm and that would probably, <laughs> sorry, I've thought about this a lot. That would also probably, <laughs> uh, you know, be something that they're not exactly expecting. And that would remove your ability to pilot the ship. And as we know from, uh, some of what we've learned so far about building for the, for Spelljammer, uh, there is an option to duel for control yes. of that spell jamming helm. And it's got some some serious uh, restraints and consequences. Uh, again, it's it's in this one where you'll you'll want to make sure that your your dedicated spellcaster who is steering the ship, uh, if you can sneak an extra or them over onto the other one, you can potentially avoid a lot of, of this unpleasantness by just taking the dang ship. <laughs> it's true. I think like, uh what like the biggest challenge with with ship to ship combat like i was mentioning at the beginning of, of when we started talking is like letting players know what the various options are to resolve it because one of the worst things you want with combat is it feeling slow paced boring or stalling out um i think like you don't want this to turn into a volley back and forth where players are kind of doing the same thing every turn and some of that falls in the DM's hands of letting players know what is possible, uh, especially if they're new to Spelljammer, because this is so different from, you know, like the D&D they might be used to. But once you start to understand the possibilities, you start to understand that there's so many different ways to end an encounter, because the most important thing about combat encounters, not just ship combat, but in general, is timing riding that very narrow line of the combat being long enough and and ha the stakes high enough and the tension high enough that it's entertaining without it becoming something that's been dragging on forever and your players are like, when is this gonna end? <laughs> that's, kinda, that's kinda the thing you wanna avoid here. That I love that. What would be, what's, what's a good way to make sure, how do you keep it exciting or how do you know when it maybe isn't hitting? I think you know when it's not hitting where you start to see, I guess, like um, people talking about what they can't do, right? It, it, like that, that to me is like a, a clue in as a DM. If people are like, well, I can't get over there, then that lets me know, oh, my players are frustrated, right? Like if, if, if I have a large, because I love doing really large combats, I'm sure I'm sure you you know that Amy you've you've worked with me before. I love having lots of moving parts. And sometimes I can tell my that my players are feeling a little overwhelmed or lost or uh feel like their characters aren't kitted out to do anything when they start thinking of like, well, what can I do? You know? And that's your clue as a DM to be like, well, how do I let this person know what the options are? Because if they're like, well, I'm I'm a melee character. I, I can't really hit with the beliefs. So I'm not doing a good job of it. Also, it's boring. And we're, you know, th th this this ranger here is hitting at range and, and this warlock is. And I don't know. That's your clue to be like, well, maybe the enemy ship has a boarding party. And now there are people rushing onto and they're going to try to duel the person with the spell jammer helm. And it's your job to intercept it. Like, I think that's your chance to uh, kind of change things up and move things around because you never want your players to focus on what they can't do. And it's important to listen in on that and, and make sure you come up with a way for them to feel like they have a role in the battle. Like they're not, a, a, you know, they're not in the stands watching, but they're a part of it. That's amazing advice, uh, which I plan to put into action immediately. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, we so much more is coming our way when Spelljammer gets here. Uh, you can already, if you've claimed the Academy Adventure, you can also check out the Squid Ship, which will show you that there are, are both bludgeoning and piercing ways to ram on into something. And it has its own beautiful map version. But are there any final words of advice that you would have for players or DMs who want to take this on or who aren't sure they can navigate it or who aren't sure how to make the most of it or who love naval stuff, like the, the full spectrum, the people who already love it, the people who are worried to try it? How should they approach spell ship combat? I think uh, approach it knowing that the rules are there to facilitate what you want to do. 
but ultimately you're not beholden to them. Like, like I always view the rules as not something that is in my way, but something that is there to help us sort of navigate, well, this is what we want to do. And this tells us how to do it. And like you mentioned earlier, Amy, if you don't want to deal with the, the vector mechanics or whatever of, of gravity fields, I highly recommend like just dispensing it, like, like do the version of this combat that makes sense for you and your adventure um, and enjoy it. Take the aspects of what makes this exciting for you and employ those and make sure you do it in a way that is communicated very clearly to everyone at the table. So everyone has the same expectations, especially when it comes to like character creation. Cause like I was saying, there's a lot of abilities that otherwise don't shine in D and D that shine very much in Spelljammer. You want to make sure your players are kind of aware of that so that when they're coming into it, highly recommend reading that wonderful article by, by uh, Michael Galvas. Um, that way when they come into it, they do feel like they have agency and sort of like they could be a part of the action. I think that's my my biggest tip. But also give way to whimsy. Like like I think Spelljammer to me is so amazing because let's be honest, these you're not going to see these ships in your Sails of Glory game. Like I I love ship combat, but there is not going to be a ship like the Squid in <laughs> Most of these wouldn't even be structurally sound or seaworthy or spaceworthy. Um, but I think that's what makes them fun. And so it's this this mishmash of of uh, fantasy and and being in space and I guess like give in to the whimsy and wonder of it. And if you want to do a grim dark sci-fi game, do that. hundred percent, I would be into it. Invite me to your table. Um, but you know, let let your players know like, these are the stakes. And I think that will get rid of a lot of the growing pains you might have uh, playing this with the table who's new to it, because then they understand that space is dark and unfeeling. And uh, unless you're in, depend, depending on where you are, it's dark and no one could hear you scream. I was just trying to get to the alien reference and I ha was not getting there, but you know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I am with you very much. And I do love that it does allow for just the most terrifying situations, the most whimsical situations. But again, that magic existing doesn't mean nothing matters. It just means the rules are weirder than you expect. And they're always weirder than you expect. And the dangers are weirder than you expect. And uh, the possibilities are bigger than you might be ready for. And that's what makes it so exciting, uh, for me at least. This is my angle on why I'm excited to jump further into this. There are, of course, many more ships that you will be able to start looking through when Spelljammer Adventures in Space comes to us on Tuesday, August 16th. Um, I... I'm looking through some of them now, and I'm excited. <laughs> You should check out, there's a, a wonderful video with Chris Perkins where you get a glimpse of some of these various options. Um, and I would say definitely let your imagination lead you. They can be, I think, as fun or as dark as you want based on some of these concepts. Um, make sure that you're... <laughs> Make sure you're checking this out. Um, the pre-order perks come with this if you get it by the time it comes out and they are very cool. The Academy claim is gonna be up until the book comes out and it is at no cost. So make sure you've snagged that. We've got the Dice of Flourishing right now. We've got some great sub perks this month. And next week is gonna be very exciting on the channel. Not only is Spelljammer coming out, so you might wanna be on Twitch for some fun celebration, but Thursday, a week from now, is something called Wizards Presents. And we know it's going to be cool. And we know it has some rad hosts like Ginny D. And we know it's going to have a bunch of announcements about Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. And I know that you should join us there and stick around on Twitch if you'd like for a live celebration afterwards with me and Michael Galvis and Todd Kenrick. Uh, and other than that, we'll have to see what that contains. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can people find you for more? Uh, you can find me at that bronze girl uh, everywhere. Twitter, uh, uh, inst Instagram, Twitch, TikTok. Yes, TikTok. <laughs> I have to learn the TikTok. I'm I'm fascinated by it. We uh I I it seems like a very scary time sink, but I will learn it. Um and you'll never <laughs> see me again. So that's gonna work out great. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time on D D Beyond. <laughs>